Hi folks, God bless you and love to everybody out there. I'm just doing a quick video on contradictions in the Bible. And I met a Christian down at Hyde Park. Excuse me. And he asked me about <coughs> some contradiction in the Bible and I, I, I gave him a roundabout answer. But I just want to say one or two things just to help you. When somebody comes to give a contradiction in the Bible, how to deal with it, all right? Okay. So my website is jasonbirdspreacher.com. You can get me on Facebook. You can get me on Twitter, all right? I'm going to pray. Father, I pray that this video will be a help to people, an encouragement to people. I just pray you bless it to people's hearts, Lord, and may they know your love and grace, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay. I'm going to just give a few things, a few uh, pointers to help you deal with people concerning contradictions, okay? Okay. So I'm going to give you some resources. If you go onto a website called Christian Think Tank, Christian Think Tank, uh, it's a, a website called Christian Think Tank, and if you go there, there's a massive paper that he's done looking at the, the alleged contradictions um, on, in the Gospels, all right? And it's a very lengthy article, very scholarly article, and it's really, really good. That is um, Christian Think Tank. Type in contradictions in the resurrection uh, and uh, Christian Think Tank. Contradictions in the Resurrection, and is a glorious article there. Very, very long, very scholarly, brilliant. I would recommend you to go and read that. That will help you immensely if you've got issues about contradictions in the Bible. All right? I'll share with you my background. My background is I'm from the Reformed camp. I'm from the Reformed Calvinistic camp. In the Reformed Calvinistic camp, there is a long heritage of scholarship. So, for example, I'm influenced by the Princeton theologians like Charles Hodge, B.B. Warfield, etc. So, and also the early Westminster Theological Seminary guys such as Robert Dick Wilson and people like that. Now, these were massive scholars. So, they were used to attacks on the Bible and answering those attacks, all right? Now, I went to Theological Seminary uh, an evangelical seminary that became liberal and there were a lot of attacks at, in that seminary on the Bible and for four years I had to listen to scholars who attacked the Bible and said there were contradictions in the Bible but because I had a reformed heritage of good scholarship I was able to deal with those attacks I also studied at MA level for a number of years because I had to do two to study MA two times and two times I didn't get the MA because I, I fell ill or I got a job working in a church in, distant from where I was doing the MA. So by rights I should have two MAs, but I, I studied at MA level for four years. And again, the scholars there criticised the Bible. So I'm speaking from a lot of academic experience of people attacking the Bible. And my, my, my main point for you to remember is this. It's number one, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Like Just because you might have an intellectual problem in one area of the Bible, don't throw all the Bible out. Alright? Hold on in faith and pray and say, Lord, I've got a problem. There seems to be a contradiction here in the Bible. I'm praying, Lord, show me the answer. Show me some person can help me or a book or something, all right? So just pray. 
And then what God will do is he'll bring you an article, a book, a, a lecture, a talk, or somebody, and they'll be able to answer. I've done that many, many times. I've come to difficult passages in the Bible, and I've prayed, and then I've got the answer. Either a book's come my way, or a lecture, or a CD, or a DVD, or an individual, and I've been able to get the answer. All right. So that's a very important advice. Don't abandon the Bible just because you've got one or two problems that you're struggling with. Just hold on and pray, and God will show you. Number two, we have the scholarship, we have the resources. Evangelicals, conservative evangelicals, we have mighty great scholars that we can go to from the past and today. And there are resources that you can go to. So don't think that you can't have answers to these questions. You can. Okay. Thirdly, if you go to Christian Think Tank, there's an article there on the resurrection looking at contradictions, so-called contradictions. And then if you go to um, my website, jasonburnspreacher.com, if you, you search on there, free books, there's a book that you can download for free on dealing with contradictions. It's a large academic work done by, I think it's somebody, Archer or somebody. But it, it, the, the title is Dealing with Contradictions. And, and there's 500, 800 page. It's a massive work looking at hundreds and hundreds of uh, accusations that there are contradictions in the Bible and it looks at them all and it answers them all, and many of the answers are very, very good. All right, so that's a free resource that you can get on my channel, on my website, jasonburspreacher.com. All right, um, what else is there? Yeah, so th those, those are some resources that you, can, that you can use, okay? Also, if you go on John Frame's website, type in John Frame, Christian philosopher John Frame. He shares a website with a guy called Poitras. Alright? So John Frame and Poitras. But type in John Frame website uh, Christian philosopher. You get this website and he shares it with a fellow scholar called Poitras. Poitras has done two or three books on dealing with contradictions and they are brilliant. He, he does one Inerrancy and the Gospels uh, there's three books where he looks at so-called contradictions of the Bible, principally around the Gospels. And they are excellent, excellent books. Very rich in scholarship, very detailed, brilliant works. You need to read them. If you're really struggling intellectually about contradictions of the Bible, that's where you need to go. All right. Now I'm just going to read one or two things just to help you. This is by David Bowen, PhD, at Vanderbilt University. He says, Professor Ehrman has pointed out, all four Gospels report the resurrection with vastly different details. Why the discrepancies? Which of the four is the most accurate? The short answer to your question is that all four of the Gospel accounts are completely accurate. The only quibble I have with Professor Ehrman's characterization of the resurrection accounts in the four canonical Gospels is your word vastly above. I would definitely agree that the four Gospels report the resurrection with different details. I would not agree that they are vastly different. Why are they different? The answer is that part that each author has a different purpose for writing in a different immediate audience. But that recognition is no way means that the authors were making the historical facts fit the particular bias. The more accurate answer is that the Gospel authors experience the events from different angles. John, Matthew, perhaps Mark, or receive their information from careful research using different eyewitness sources, Luke, because they saw what happened from different places, literally and metaphorically, they wrote with different perspectives. As every journalist school in the world will tell us, accounts that differ on details are not necessarily contradictory or untrue. For example, Matthew says that the woman came to the tomb of Jesus very early in the morning, the day after the Sabbath, and saw the angel of the Lord. But Mark mentions three women coming to the tomb and encountering a young man there. As for the woman, wherever 
We have three women, we necessarily have two women. Matthew did not think it significant for his purpose to mention Siloam, but Mark did. Although Mark says that the woman met a young man at the tomb, and Matthew says it was an angel, they both describe the person as dressed in white. Mark merely says that the appearance of the young man elicited amazement from the woman, while Matthew says his appearance was, was like lightning. They are clearly both describing the same phenomenon through different points of view. Luke does not mention how many women or which woman specifically came to the tomb, but he does say they encountered two men there, not one man, and John agrees with his number. There is no problem that Matthew and Mark only mentioned the one man, or angel, who actually did the talking, while John, Luke and John had the detail which was important to them that there were actually two of these things present. Far from indicating error, these differing details lend credibility to the authenticity of the accounts. If everyone describes an event exactly the same way, the, de the discerning reader or juror should suspect collusion or rehearsed story. So that's uh, Dr. David Bowen looking at the resurrection account. So when somebody says, oh, there's a contradiction here in the Gospels, he's saying that they, come, they are very similar, but there are differences because each one is coming from a different perspective. Now, uh, another resource that you can go and find very helpful is Dr. Timothy McGrew, Alleged Contradictions in the Gospels. Dr. Timothy McGrew, Alleged Contradictions in the Gospels. You can Google Dr. Timothy McGrew, Timothy McGrew, M-C-G-R-E-W and he, you can download his PDF papers looking at the critics who, who say that there are contradictions in the Gospels and he answers them. And, uh, he, and, he, and he notes there are five common sources of apparent contradictions. People who accuse the Bible of contradictions. Some say there's been carelessness. Some say there's not a completeness. Um, I'll read it. It says, five common sources of apparent contradiction. Carelessness, interpreting a phrase or sentence without regard to gender or narrative content. So if, what he's saying here, when people are saying there are contradictions, they're making these mistakes. Carelessness. Interpreting in a phrase or sentence without regard to gender or genre or na narrative context. So you find a lot of critics when they say there's a contradiction, they're not understanding the genre of the text or the nature of the narrative. All right. Number two, completeness. Assuming that every account of an event includes every significant detail about it. So we look at it and we expect absolute detail in every area. And he's saying that's not the way to read ancient literature. And a lot of people make mistakes by expect putting too much burden onto the Bible. When the Bible is ancient literature and you must read it some in the, as ancient literature, the way the genre of that literature is written at the time. So for example, the Gospels are historical biography, but they're his first century historical biography and you have to understand first century uh, AD writing in order to understand the nature of the writing of the Gospels all right conflation treating two different events or persons as the same so sometimes we can say there's a contradiction but it doesn't necessarily mean it's the same event confusion treating the same event or person as different so sometimes you look at the same event and then you say it's different, so that's the other way around. Context, ignoring facts about the language and culture of the events or assuming that those are identical to the cultural context we share today. So we impose our, our thinking on the text rather than looking at the cultural background of a text. So...
So here's an example of how we can misunderstand something. Who made the public proclamation and declaration of the independence from the balcony of the Old State House of Boston on the morning of July 1776? Some early sources say it was William Greenleaf, High Sheriff of Suffolk, Suffolk County. Other early sources say it's the colonial Thomas Crafts. Actually, both Greenleaf and Crafts read the declaration from the balcony. Greenleaf had a weak voice, and the crowd could not hear him clearly, so Kraft, who had the cent a centurion voice, repeated it after him loudly enough for all to hear. So on the third face, surface, it looked like a contradiction. On the July 18, 1776, it was Greenleaf who read the Declaration of Independence. But some say it was Colonial Thomas Kraft, and, oh look, there's a contradiction, but no. They both read it. Alright? And that's what critics can do with the Bible. They, they can assume contradiction. But until you get the background information and, and, and look at the source and look at the cultural context and other information, until you do that, you're not going to get the answer. So we're just going to look at one contradiction in, in the Gospels. Alleged contradiction, the genealogies of Jesus. In Matthew 1.16, the Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was Jesus born, who is called Christ. In Luke 3.23, Jesus, when he began his ministry, was about 30 years of age, being the son, as was supposed, of Joseph, the son of Heli. Here it is. Apparently, according to Matthew, Joseph's father's name was Jacob. Whereas according to Luke, Joseph's father's name was Eli. The two ge genealogies diverge widely all the way back to David a thousand years earlier. Assumption both genealogies are meant to give ancestry of Joseph, Jesus' adopted father. The assumption is false. The genealogy in Luke goes through Mary, not through Joseph. The appearance of contradiction arises because the critic has conflated the two, two distinct genealogies. Two clues in the text suggest that the assumption is false. The Greek in Luke 3 does not say the son of Eli, but rather simply of Eli. The word son is not repeated after the first usage. Two, the, loca the, the, the location of the qualifying phrase, who was the son, as it was supposed of, Joseph. And the omission of this possessive definite article, tau, before Joseph's name, make it plain that Joseph is not part of the lineal descent being given. A related complaint, Luke gives many more generations than Matthew does for the part where the two genealogies were in parallel. Do these people never open the book that they believe? Quote, this is Richard Dawkins. Do these people never open the book that they believe is the literal truth? Why don't they notice those glaring contradictions? Shouldn't literalists worry about the fact that Matthew traces Joseph's descent from David via 28 intermediate generations? While Luke has 41 generations, Richard Dawkins, The God Delusion, page 120. The response. Matthew does skip over some generation, but it is not required that either genealogy should give each link always from the father to the son. Its purpose is to establish Jesus' legal descent, not to give every step in the descent. Note the way that Matthew opens the genealogy, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. A second complaint. But Matthew counts the generation and comes up with three groups of 14. How can be the skipping generation if he is counting them? Assumption, the only purpose of counting the generation is to specify the total number of father to son links in the list. Answer to the second complaint. The purpose of Matthew's counting is not to specify the number of father to son generation, but rather to break the list into three parts, setting 14 names in each. Why? Possibly for easy memorization, See the similar convention in Zohar. Additionally, in Hebrew, the numerical value of the name David is 4 plus 6 plus 4 equals 14. And he answers these, these so-called contradictions in a, in a really good way. And I've got two, pa two, two PDF papers on the Gospels 
which are very helpful. Alleged contradictions in the Gospels, part one, Dr. Timothy McGrew, M-C-G-R-E-W, PDF. You can also listen to the lectures. You can also listen to other material that that I've done on, on, on this YouTube channel on contradictions uh, in the Bible that you'll find videos on that. So. so that's for the brother I met in Hyde Park. He was asking me about contradictions. I can't remember fully about the one that you specifically asked me about, but I've given you some resources. Um, if you go to Apologetics Press, Apologetics Press, see what material there. If you go to Calm uh, Apologetics or Matt Slick's Apologetics website, Calm Apologetics, Matt Slick's we Apologetics website, he's got a website there and, he'll, and he, he deals with contradictions. Apologetics Press is a good website, they deal with uh, contradictions. But the book on my website deals with many, many contradictions from Old and New Testament. McGrew deals with the Gospels. Poitras on John Frame's website deals with the Gospels and um, looks at the contradictions that skeptics claim about the Gospels. The Poitras book is a very good book that you can download for free. There's three books, I think, that there that will really, really strengthen your faith if you're doubting, if you think there are contradictions in the Bible. They will really give you meat and strength. Uh, in your faith. So let's pray. Hope oh, that's been a blessing. Let's pray. Father, we just come before you today and I just pray that this video will be a blessing to people, a help to people, an encouragement to people, a strength to people. And Father, that you'd use it to bless people in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you all. That's been a blessing. And uh, God bless and have a lovely day.